have hit hit an atom and go away. It's always inelastic, right? See? So you cannot <laughs> you cannot have elastic scattering. Right. So the only way to understand this is that when M is not just an atom, when this M is not just an atom, but what is going on? But uh, huh? don't use the button on M. Yeah, yeah, no, this one is button. Uh, is uh, solid as a whole. Okay, if you transfer momentum not to not not to each atom, but as a sample as a whole. Okay, so you know if you think neutron as a particle, this is not going to happen. So you have to think neutron as a wave and coherently transmit this momentum, all right, to the whole solid. And then scatter away, right? Okay, so in a sense, it's a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon. In classical physics, it never happens, of course, which we know that. But still, this uh, quantum, you have to understand this, uh, you know, purely quantum mechanical nature. You know that this m correspond to the mass of the whole sample, 10 to 22 atoms or something like that, right? Right. So in this case, indeed, the energy loss is a very, very tiny portion of the initial energy, like 10 to minus 22, okay? So in this case, we can declare this uh, scattering to be elastic, right? And that's what it is. So if you have a big crystal, you are really transferring whole momentum to the crystal. So converse of that is that if you are study, studying, say, nanocrystals or something like that, tiny, tiny uh, molecule, then can you have elastic scattering? No. Okay. Or how about the liquid? No. So you get no elastic scattering from liquid. All right? <laughs> because you cannot transfer momentum coherently to the whole liquid. All right? So in this case, uh, what you get is so-called quasi-elastic scattering. Quasi-elastic, in between elastic and inelastic, all right? Uh, and uh, energy transfer depends on the size of the system. The bigger the system, you know, energy loss becomes smaller and smaller, so it becomes more and more like elastic scattering. But actually, you are doing quasi-elastic scattering. So in a sense, it's everything is related to the resolution of your measurement, right? So when you talk about elastic or inelastic, we also have to be aware of the resolution of the machine, right? And if you know that you're looking at the structure of crystal, then you don't have to worry about it. But uh, today, many people are studying nanocrystals and much more complex, uh, you know, molecular stuff and all that then you do have to worry about it, okay? So, uh, uh, usual uh, resolution of a triple axis system is like one millivolt, right? And uh, uh, if you don't, well, you, we get into a triple, triple axis system later on. Uh, Colin introduced this, this concept a little bit, right? Triple axis. And uh, in diffraction, we use double axis, but uh, as we discuss later on, uh, if energy transfer is too big, then uh, uh, the assignment of momentum transfer Q becomes uh, uh, questionable. So essentially, you know, uh, if a system is small, we have a problem. We have a problem. Uh, later on, we'll discuss uh, correction to this uh, effect, so-called Plachek correction. Uh, not this week. When we discuss uh, in maybe next month, when we discuss this uh, local structure breaker problem, that uh, you think you're doing elastic scattering measurement. Actually, some of the measurement uh, or some of the intensity you measure are inelastic. Then you have to make a correction for this time. Okay. 
So if, 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 what, what I want to come across is that the unlike X-ray scattering, uh, neutron scattering is uh, inherently, you know, uh, closer to inelastic. You always run into elastic, inelastic all the time. In X-ray scattering, because the energy of incident energy, uh, incident X-ray is so big, like, you know, tens of kilowatts, compared to photon energies, which is uh, tens of a minimum, right? So, uh, essentially, that uh, uh, momentum transfer uh, is so small compared to the initial momentum. So, uh, X-ray scattering is very close to elastic scattering. Uh, you have to work hard to get inelastic scattering out of X-rays. But uh, neutrons are not like that. So, knowing that, uh, how do we understand the intensity of this uh, elastic scattering? And uh, <coughs> calling by using this Born approximation already introduced, the equation that uh, this uh, Ri uh, for elastic case, okay? R is that uh, compared to uh, R is the uh, uh, position of the detector, okay? Um, e to uh, I Q R. I'm sorry, it's uh, I'm using capital. So. And uh, uh, intensity is just that. So I chose some, you know, origin out of out of nothing. Okay. Uh, so homework number one. <laughs> homework number one is that uh, the choice of origin is irrelevant for the uh, neutron intensity. If you calculate I then where you choose the origin uh, becomes irrelevant. Okay? That's homework number one. Show that diffraction intensity is independent of the choice of the origin. Right? You can choose anywhere as an origin. Okay? So the question is that the here, again, the I goes away as a KF. Now it's elastic, so KI magnitude of KI is equal to the magnitude of KF. It's elastic. Okay? And let's see if this is the origin. So, uh, you know, internal waves are plane wave. Outgoing wave is also plane wave. Not of R, but it doesn't matter. You know, R is so big. So, if R, Ri is not at the origin, what happens to the wave which is scattered by this uh, atom which is not at Ri? Okay. And you can see, easily see that uh, if, uh, if you consider that's the, that's Q, minus Q, depends on how you define Q, can be you know, this way or that way. If the uh, uh, line going is going through origin and then perpendicular to the Q, you can easily see that the path from here to here, okay, these two paths are the same, right? Okay, they are the same because this di this distance is equal. this distance. Uh, uh, this is here. Is it that one? Okay. So uh, that means uh, that's the origin of uh, Q dot R I. R I. 
because if there Ri is uh, perpendicular to Q, you know, this uh, uh, product is here. Okay. So if you move this, the Ri along the perpendicular axis, nothing's going to happen. So all what count is the Ri component, which is tau to Q. And then you, figure, you can figure out that uh, this uh, uh, easily, that uh, the phase shift, OK? Here's a phase, and that's a phase. The phase shift is equal to uh, uh, QR, QRR. Uh, we can figure that out, OK? This is like that. This is theta, theta. Right. So this this is uh, so uh, this is our right? and this is theta. So this this is, is sine r i times sine theta, right? r i sine theta. R i sine r i. And then there are two of them, two R sine theta. And that is the extra path length, right? Path length, delta R. So that uh, so delta R is Ri times or two Ri sine. Theta, okay, and then uh, uh, therefore phase shift is k delta r. Okay. So uh, r i two uh, k sine theta times okay. and then uh, uh, because this is like K, 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 Q. Right. So Q is two K. So this is equal to Q times R. So that that's essentially what the Born approximation tells you. Okay. So well, I think you know this, but essentially the phase shift, therefore is equal to uh, e to i q dot r i, right? And if you have many diffraction centers, sine phi phase shift is uh, origin times sum of i of uh, e to i. And uh, this factor is the important factor, but uh, uh, it's called scattering amplitude. So uh, uh, if you consider the fact that each atom may, be, may not be chemically identical, so this becomes um, uh, in normalized unit. So here, that uh, bi is the scattering length of each atom, and how little b is the uh, compositional average of the system. So this is the only thing we need to know, right? Uh, we uh, sort of uh, absorb this uh, uh, the prefactor because if you, uh, it just gives you amplitude, constant amplitude, nothing to do with the so the diffraction, everything in diffraction is included in this factor. It's very simple. So elastic scattering in diffraction is simple. It's just if you understand this equation, you understand everything. Okay. So let's look at this equation and uh, see see what it means. Right. 
And again, uh, if uh, R is independent, uh, is perpendicular to Q, it doesn't matter. So we consider only the component R to Q. Okay. So uh, let's consider if you uh, uh, just magnitude of this uh, component R uh, happens to be. Uh, 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 regular, for instance, a uh, one-dimensional periodic uh, system, okay, like that. Uh, spacing is A, and we have uh, N atoms like that. So Ri would be, uh, I'm sorry, I is confusing here. So uh, I use uh, N, okay. Uh, Ri is uh, n minus 1 times a. Right? Uh, then this goes, uh, sorry, goes to big n. Okay? So n is equal to 1, 2, to n. Right? Then this series uh, becomes E2 I Q N minus one A, right? Which is summation over E2 I Q A two N minus one. Right? You know, if you if you assume e two i q a is x, this is just a x two minus one one plus x plus x square minus x two x two n minus one. Right? Just in a geometrical series. Okay. Uh, you can sum this up. Remember how to do that? <laughs> Way back, maybe it is in high school or something, right? Uh, you know, again, uh, you you are if you have a very good memory, you can memorize equations. That's fine. I don't stop it. I don't. I don't want to stop you doing that. But uh, memory escapes you. Memory can be wrong. You cannot. You know, you can make mistakes in the memory in a small way. So. Uh, uh, but most of the time, it's easy to get this uh, done. So if it, i is equal to 1 plus x plus x plus etc. plus x to n minus 1, then uh, xi is x plus etc. plus x to n, right? So if you take a difference, 1 minus x, i is equal to 1 plus or minus, uh, minus x to n. N, right? So I is equal to 1 minus x to N over 1 minus x. Okay. <laughs> so even when you forget details, you can get it. You are not sure sometimes whether it is N, N or N minus 1 or something like that. It doesn't matter. So the point is that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, this is an interesting function of uh, N. Okay, if n is only uh, 1, uh, <coughs> uh, oh, by the way, this is not, I, I said i, but this is amplitude. So intensity is square of that, okay? And x is... Uh, Two is to calculate this intensity for n equal to two, three, uh, five, one hundred, right? 
And if you do that, you can see that the plot of uh, Q versus I would be, you know, for law, for n equal 2, it's like that. And for n equal uh, 100, if you normalize the maximum to, to, to 1, it becomes like So it becomes sharp and sharp. So that is the origin of the back peak. Uh, and then I'll ask you the what is the relationship between the width, peak width, okay? This peak width and n. So as n goes up, peak width would go go down, right? And this is relevant because again, we'll be looking at some nanoparticles. That means, you know, if you have a nanoparticle, you're not going to get black peak. You get some broad peak, right? And from the width of the peak, you can determine the size right away. And the width is uh, inversely related to one of the n. So from this, you can determine the size, okay? And today, the, uh, you know, more and more, we are looking at uh, more and more complex materials, okay? So this becomes a hardware issue right away. So, so far, it's uh, pretty elementary and trivial. Uh, uh, here, the position where the, the risk shows up is 2 pi over a. Okay? You know that uh, uh, this diffraction sum summation uh, of this uh, uh, summation is equal to one over n x to n or one minus x, right? and then uh, x is equal to e to i q a. So if uh, q a is some funny number, then uh, this uh, you know phase of this object changes a lot, plus minus etc. So they tend to cancel out. Only when x is equal to some uh, peculiar number, you get the huge intensity. Right? And that is that when x is, x is equal to 1, okay? then you are dividing 0 by 0. So you have to do derivative and get this, uh, get this uh, number. So uh, x equal 1 is in a special point of this function. And that is that the when qa equal to 2n i, some multiple of 2 pi, okay? So that means q is equal to uh, 2 pi over a times n is a special point, All right? So if you define a star, oops, a star as a 2 pi over a, then uh, K, which is uh, n times a star, is a special point. So that is the definition of this uh, reciprocal lattice that uh, Colin introduced yes, uh, last week. So, diffraction experiment means Q is equal to K. Okay. Uh, Bragg's law is that Q is equal to K. It's not trivial because Q depends on the fractional system, you know, where the beam is coming and uh, where the sample is and where the de detector is, right? So the fraction machine sets Q. Now K resides on the sample. If you have a sample, then the orientation of the sample, you know, determines this K, right? 
So diffraction experiment means to move the machine so that Q is equal to K. Align crystal beads, you know, to align the crystal orientation so that Q is equal to K. So this is uh, not a trivial equation at all. And this is equivalent to 2 pi and 2d is equal to n lambda sine n lambda sine d equivalent to that. So k is usually written as uh, h a star k b star L C star and so index H K L gives you the position in the K space where that uh, our crystals are. Right? We know that. And for simple lattice like Bravé lattice, in which uh, you have only one atom in the unit cell, all H K L are allowed. But if you have a bit more complex system like BCC or FCC, in case of BCC, body centered cubic, you have two atoms in the unit cell. In case of uh, FCC, chain centered cubic, you have four atoms in the unit cell. Then not all HKL are allowed. Okay? Only some of them are allowed. So the homework number three is to calculate. <laughs> uh, the condition for uh, BCC and FCC. What is the what is this uh, K space? And you find that the uh, reciprocal space of BCC is FCC, all right? And the reciprocal space of FCC is BCC. Okay. In other words, if you have BCC in the real space, in the reciprocal space you have FCC, vice versa. Okay. So that's homework. Now, let's go one step further and think about the case where uh, complexity comes in. And uh, let's consider the case of so-called piles transition. Transition is a, a, a rather dramatic, dramatic case of uh, electron photon coupling. So, if you have one dimensional metal, if you have one dimensional metal, so uh, and this is in which uh, uh, you have one electron per atom. So uh, E over A is equal to 1. Okay. Paolo says that uh, this system is unstable. This system is unstable. So let's see how it goes. So uh, if you have one dimensional metal, the, uh, the uh, dispersion of the electron phonon, I mean electron system rather, Electronic system is not uh, parabolic anymore, but it will be disturbed at the Brian zone battery, which is pi over a minus pi over a, so that becomes gapped like that. And within the real zone, you have two electrons yeah, spin up and down. So that means Fermi level will be here. That's Fermi. Okay. okay. So that means electrons fill through, filled up to Fermi level, and empty above. Okay. 
And uh, this happens at, uh, actually, uh, I'm <laughs> slightly drawing it wrong, because it has to be a half point at minus pi over 2a. Pi over 2a, that's where half point comes across. Then, uh, uh, actually, if you perturb the system and make the unit cell 2A rather than A, then you get the new real zone here, and then this version will become like that, okay? Like that. There's a new gap here. So as a result, electron energy is reduced a little bit, so the electron system becomes stable. So in one electron, uh, one dimensional metal with one electron uh, per atom is not stable, and it wants to become uh, insulator with a uh, unit cell of 2A. So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we change this uh, system to make the unit cell of 2A? Any idea? You can't, <laughs> you, you can't have a nuclear reaction <laughs> in the system. If you have two kinds of atoms, you have 2A from the beginning. But I'll get to that, in fact. Yeah, there are similar, similar phenomena uh, called order disorder. Right, right. right. So what happens is uh, dimerization. If you bring these, uh, you know, atoms. Uh, if you shift this a little bit, make it uh, like a diamond, right? Two atoms are close to each other and separated a bit more far. Right? That is, huh? No, it's, it, it's uh, adjusted by itself. You see that the uh, electron will move, move the atoms so that the atom will become di dimerized. Okay? It is amazing, but that's what the electron does. The electron prefers two atoms to be closer and then in between larger, all right? This happens in reality. There are many systems where the, this kind of uh, power condition happens in organic uh, uh, conductors, for instance. Okay? So in this system, at high temperature, uh, because the vibration is strong, too strong, so you know atoms are equally spaced. In this case, you have a metal. But if you go to low temperature, they become dimerized, and then becomes huh? insulator. Right. So this is a typical case of a metal insulator transition. Metal insulator transition. Right? At room temperature or high temperature, it's metallic. And if you cool it down, it becomes insulating. And at the same time, the structure changes so that the atoms become dimerized. Okay? So, the question is what happens then for the uh, uh, <coughs> diffraction intensity? So, uh, uh, let's start with the case of uh, uh, unit cell is 2A, is okay? Unit cell is 2A, but it has two atoms in it, okay? So, uh, in this case, uh, um, 
uh, whether on summation is e to e of uh, uh, this one, uh, this position is a over two, a over two, right? And this position is minus a over two. So e to uh, i q r uh, r i r one is minus a over two. And R2 is plus 2. Okay? So that's the function. So what you have is that uh, E2 minus uh, QA high times A plus E2 I QA 2, which is cosine, right? Two cosine Q A two. So in this case, uh, intensity versus Q. First, first the diffraction P is K is equal to A, A, well, A star in this case uh, is uh, uh, 2 pi over uh, 2 pi over A, uh, uh, pi over A rather. So uh, uh, K is equal to pi over A uh, because we just is 2A, right? Uh, Q so in this case, uh, this times a is uh, k q a is equal to pi. So uh, pi over cosine pi over a is zero. Right? So in this case, uh, the uh, at q equal pi two pi over a is one. Oops. But at the pi over a, intensity is zero. Now, if you then go to the case where atoms are closed, so R1, uh, R1 is minus uh, minus uh, a over 2 minus delta r2 is equal to a over 2 uh, I'm sorry plus delta minus delta okay so what you have is the uh, uh, two cosine of uh, Q A over two minus Q delta. Okay. Right. That's the that's the amplitude. And cosine of this, uh, if you <laughs> we call trigonometric metric. Again, you don't have to memorize this. You can, you know, go back to exponential and expand that, right, and and, and, and figure it out can do that. But if you believe me, then this becomes uh, cosine, cosine, uh, uh, twice over cosine q over q over a, q over 2, cosine q delta minus sine q over 2, sine Right. So for Q is equal to uh, pi over A, cosine Q over A 2 is 0, but uh, sine Q over 2 is 1. Okay. So this is 1 for sine over Q A over 2 is equal to 1. So 
the means this becomes an amplitude right in other words at the i you be sine square q delta where the q is equal to right. so depending on q yeah, the delta rather, this one uh, changes the intensity. Right? So this is a sign, this is a quantity small, so it's pretty, pretty much really close to uh, Q squared delta squared. Right? Q squared is pi over k, so it's uh, pi, over, pi squared over a squared times delta squared. Okay? So what happens is that we have Q and then a black peak at the A. And here, uh, you have nothing in between in the beginning. Uh, this is when delta goes zero. You have nothing. But if a delta increases, then this starts to increase. So in between, at the position of pi over A, you start to see. Uh, New black peak, depending on how much distortion you have. Right. So these are called super lattice peaks. Super lattice. Because original lattice is A, right? You have uh, just an A periodicity. And because of this modulation, the super, super lattice becomes 2A. Right? Unit cell become doubled because of this modulation. You see, without without, without distortion, we have AAA. You know, you have just a periodic periodic atom with a interval of A. But because of this power distortion, power distortion, the unit cell is now two A. So the unit cell become double. That make that means uh, Wilson lattice is halved. Right? So the point position of point one, uh, point five rather. In the unit of 2 pi over a, at the position of 0.5, you have a new peak, and that is called super lattice peak. Okay? So, whenever the structure is modulated, you have the super lattice peak. In some uh, materials, the modulation periodicity is not just 2, you get 10, 20. <laughs> In some very complex materials, you have a lot of big, very big, long periodicity modulation. So, if you have a unicell suddenly became ten times, where do they? Where do you get the diffraction peak? Huh? Yeah, ten times smaller. So you get. Uh, Every 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. <laughs> That's what you see. Lots of super lattice peaks. Right? Intensities are not equal, okay, depending on the, uh, you know, details of modulation. But basically, you get a lot more peaks. Right? Uh, if you look at very complex, uh, you know, material like... Uh, uh, protein, that's what happens. Okay? Uh, protein has many, many uh, atoms in it, many thousands or maybe millions of uh, atoms. So you get a lot of diffraction. When, if you have uh, protein crystals, you get lots of diffractions. Right? So these are the super lattice peaks. Now, exactly the same thing happens when, as you said, in fact, uh, you s if you start with some uh, uh, AB alloy, okay, A50B or B50, right, two kinds of atoms, but in the beginning they are mixed, you know, randomly A and B are mixed, okay. So in this case, average periodicity is A, right? But if it is completely ordered, like this is A and this is B, A, right? Then uh, periodicity is again 2A, 
right? In this case. So what happens if you start with random alloy, which you can produce uh, by going to high temperature and very quickly cool down? It's called quenching, right? If you go to high temperature where the system is random and quench, then you have this random AB alloy, right? Then you have, again, uh, diffraction peak at that 2 pi over A, nothing in between, right? Then if you bring down this at the, room, room, at the low temperature, well, room temperature, nothing happens. But if you room it up a little bit, you know, not too high, but a little bit, you know, if you have a few hundred degree, depends on the system, but say 500 degree or something like that, then atoms would start moving. Right? So they tend to, they all start exchanging positions and they become gradually older. Right? Uh, you know, this happens if you mix boy, boy and girls. Uh, well, it depends on the age, but I mean, <laughs> 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 when, when they are very young, they tend to segregate them, <laughs> boys and girls, okay? <laughs> but uh, beyond 15 years old or something. Some, uh, <laughs> beyond, beyond this <laughs> certain age, they tend to pair, pair up, right? It's, a, it's just a question of time. <laughs> <laughs> if you have enough time, then uh, ordering will happen, right? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what this is. So what happens if uh, this uh, chemical ordering happens to a system? What do you think would happen? Here at the pi over a, you start to see you start to see the peak, okay, and this peak grows as the order increases, okay. So you can you can see this ordering, chemical ordering directly by diffraction, right? So this is another case where this uh, uh, doubling of a unit cell produces new uh, peak, okay? So this is uh, just an, uh, you know, one case, a special case of doubling, but as I said, the periodicity can change in uh, uh, very different ways. Sometimes uh, the new periodicity, uh, which shows up uh, uh, for instance, a guy by going to low temperature or something, could be incommensurate with respect to the original, original lattice. Instead of twice, it could be 2.3 or like pi 3.14, <laughs> something like that. Okay? This happens. This happens. So in this case, you get that, uh, Incommensurate super lattice peaks like that. Okay, this uh, delta Q is not an integer in the unit of uh, A star. Okay, some uh, some strange uh, num the real number times A star. Okay, uh, again X is one over n if I unit, if you know the uh, periodicity, extra periodicity, but x can be some uh, uh, or that the inverse of uh, non-integer, non okay? So uh, 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 this quite, have, quite often happens, uh, for instance, if you have extra periodicity such as magnetism. You know, magnetic periodicity may be incommensurate with the original uh, lattice periodicity. Uh, in ferromagnetic case, all lined up, so it's simple. In anti ferromagnetic case, it's up, down, up, down, right? So in this case, you are simply doubling the unit cell, just like a chemical case or that uh, uh, the power structure case. But you can have a very strange periodicity. When? What kind of magnetism would produce strange periodicity? Have you heard of this? No? 
Yes. Yeah, helical case, for instance. Helix. You start from this and then uh, helically going up like that. Okay? And there are many helical banks. Uh, lots of rare earth system and rare compounds show, show such a helical bank. Uh, uh, actually, that uh, is not the case of magnetism, but in, in structure too. I mean, DNA has a helical structure, right? DNA, DNA helix is like that, right? And periodicity, I forgot what it is, but I mean, eight, or eight point something. That is also in convention. So, in reality, you know, you can have, you, you start with a simple structure, and then you can have modulation of the structure by sort of a superimposing uh, super structure, additional order parameter. This happens all the time. Right? Uh, not only magnetism, uh, for instance, uh, ferroelectricity. Ferroelectricity case, uh, quite often that they have a uh, uh, dimerization of different uh, uh, positive and negative ion. So in this case, periodicity doesn't change. But if you have anti ferroelectricity, polarization is this way, that way, you know, in this case, periodicity is double. So there are many cases of uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, structural modulations happen in the real systems, and uh, they are very much related to the uh, uh, functionality. Uh, for instance, uh, there are a lot of uh, research going on. There's a multi-ferroics, right? multi There was a system which is ferroelectric, and also at the same time some magnetic. And uh, in this case also, uh, if you have a, man a helical magnetic structure, it is easy, uh, much easier to, for the magnetism to couple to, to, to a lattice in a multi ferroic way. If they are commensurate, they tend to be separate. You know, ferroelectricity occurs and magnetism occurs and they don't talk to each other. But if uh, you know, the ferroelectricity is incommensurate, they just cannot ignore. You know, they, they collide somewhere. They cannot uh, live in different space. They they uh, they collide. So as a result, the uh, magnetism can influence ferroelectricity. Therefore, uh, ferroelectricity influences lattice, so-called uh, you know piezoelasticity. The lattice uh, deforms. Okay. So uh, that means if you change magnetism, you can change the lattice size. So that's a very interesting. Uh, uh, functionality. Usually, that uh, ferroelectricity, ferroelectricity is used to mod modulate lattice. The piezo piezoelectricity is commonly used. Where is it used? Piezoelastic uh, uh, materials or piezoelectric materials? Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the scanning STM uses, uh, in fact. Uh, but uh, in, in a sort of, uh, you know, daily life, something less expensive. We have here. Also microphones or speakers, you know. We change electric signal into vibration, therefore voice, okay. So uh, usually electricity is changed, electric signal is changed to the, to the uh, Vibration and the speaker, but uh, if you have multi electric multi you know, magnetic field can do that. Okay, or that they, by changing this uh, dimension, you can change the magnetism. So these uh, interesting functionality comes about because of this uh, much more complex periodicity. Right. So in old days, we were studying only just uh, you know. BCC, FCC, <laughs> etc. But uh, today's uh, uh, interesting functional materials are much more complex. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of uh, order parameter which sometimes are competing, you know, superconductivity and banks are competing all the, all the time, right? And uh, 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 all that are coexisting, all this uh, uh, complex uh, behavior that happen. Uh, 
uh, any question on this uh, subject of uh, uh, publicity? Uh, as for the observation, uh, there will be, uh, I think, that uh, uh, different uh, sex sessions. Uh, the simplest uh, way to observe this is a theta two theta scan, right? Uh, if you come with the uh, some kind of a K K I. This is two theta. So. Uh, in case of powder scattering, you just you know, move this detector. But uh, newer design, uh, including SNS and others, uh, have a sample on detector all over the place. All over the place. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, powder machine at the SNS called Nomad uh, has a uh, three pi coverage out of four pi. Okay, all angles, uh, solid angles, total is 4 pi, right? And now out of 4 pi, 3 pi, 75% of the di directions are covered by the detectors. Okay, so you come in with a neutron and uh, nothing is, uh, you know, almost everything is caught by, by the detectors, right? 75% of uh, incoming uh, neutrons produce signal. So you have uh, lots of signal. Uh, so as a result, this... Uh, uh, a NOMAD diffractometer. Uh, it's a neutron diffractometer, and uh, usual neutron count is much lower than X rays. But this one achieves 1 million counts per second. Okay, 1 million per counts per second. 10 to 6, 10 to 6 count per second. It's an uh, enormous, uh, enormously high intensity for neutron scattering. It's almost like X ray scattering. So you can do the measurement, how the measurement in a very short time. Uh, you know, minutes instead of uh, hours. <coughs> in X-ray too, if you use a uh, uh, very high intensity synchrotron beam and then use the, this uh, uh, two-dimensional detectors, then uh, uh, sometimes you can measure the power pattern in milliseconds. Okay, so things have changed. In old days, when you were using films, <laughs> it took a long time for the X-ray diffraction to to, uh, to 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 measure. But these days, with this uh, electronic systems, you can you can move in measure in milliseconds. That means that uh, you can follow something which is moving with time, right? You can uh, you can follow reactions, for instance, phase transformation from one system to the other. Or that you can change time, uh, you know, temperature quickly, and then see how uh, the system would, would uh, change with the with the temperature. So you can get a lots of a lot more data today than uh, than possible yesterday. So today, um, the uh, uh, in all the sort of pattern, you know, we all either do power diffraction that way. I mean, divide all, divide share up out of the fraction, or single crystal diffraction, in either case, it takes time. Now it is not, it's not like that. Out of the fraction is very fast, and uh, we can determine structure in uh, quite short, quite a, relatively, uh, quite, a, quite a short time. And the analysis method has advanced uh, thanks to the uh, advancing computer. Today's PCs, you know, much faster than the mainframe computer 20, 30 years ago, right? <laughs> so you can do uh, wonderful things, even with a PC or with a small computer. So structure determination, uh, per se, is almost uh, uh, trivial today. So that means we can uh, study uh, much more complex uh, uh, structure, sometimes a, a system which is not fully periodic not fully per periodic. There's some kind of a disorder in the system, or some uh, you know, partial order, etc. Uh, and these are important uh, in many materials. For instance, uh, polymers are not fully ordered. Okay, polymers are not completely glassy. It's a partially crystalline, partially uh, glassy. And uh, liquid crystals, you know, 
some uh, molecular systems, have a partial order. And these things are now can be studied by this uh, diffraction technique. And particularly, uh, as I said, that uh, if you have uh, extra order, like uh, magnetism, then you can follow that uh, by this uh, diffraction technique as the order parameter develops. Right? You can follow this by this kind of uh, measurement. So, uh, uh, again, to uh, summarize, diffraction is easy. It's just uh, you, you need to know sum of E2 I Q R I. I'm using I, but you know this I, imaginary I, and the uh, index I are not the same thing, of course, right? Uh, and if you have different uh, materials, you just do that, okay? And uh, that's the amplitude, and intensity, square. So that means square j v i b j and exponential i q. So uh, there's nothing to it. But you have to understand what this equation means. Yeah, that's, that's all about this diffraction. So I, I gave you an exa example of a periodic system with extra, uh, extra periodicity imposed on it. So next time on Thursday, uh, I go over to more complex system where uh, there's a uh, uh, length scale which is larger than the atomic scale. For instance, uh, instead of a uh, uh, big crystal or the uh, totally periodic case, if there are some kind of small, small clusters, small particles, like that, for instance. Then you can have, uh, I told you that the peak, will, peak becomes broader, but at the same time, you have small angle scattering. So small angle scattering is a very useful technique to assess some uh, uh, structure which is mesoscopic. Okay, not atomic, but uh, superatomic. The length scale from 100 angstrom to uh, you know micron. This kind of uh, uh, scale can be assessed by small angle scattering using neutrons, it's called small angle neutron scattering, or SANS. And also that the, we'll discuss uh, case uh, effect of uh, local disorder, including the thermal vibration. So atoms are not static. Uh, you know, only in classics uh, static, but uh, quantum mechanical atoms are vibrating because of that, you know, zero point oscillation. And on top of that, because at room temperature above, because of the thermal photons, thermal matter vibration moves atoms around. So atoms are never static. And this uh, uh, fact not only gives rise to inelastic neutron scattering, of course, moving atoms produces inelastic scattering, but elastic scattering is also modified at the same time. Okay? So we'll discuss how Elastic scattering is modified by this uh, thermal uh, neutron, uh, as thermal at atomic vibration, uh, resulting in so called divide volar factor. And then discuss also uh, disorder systems like liquid glasses, in which you, know, you cannot make a simple approximation. Good. So I gave you three homeworks today, and uh, uh, this all relates to this uh, 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 interpretation of this equation. Next week, or next, not next week, on Thursday, we'll discuss small angle scattering and the Bible effect. Thank you.